Hello, hello, everybody. It's your boy, the one and only Sir Patrick in the Department of Biology. Anyway, I am here because I'd like to give you a very warm welcome in our biogeography class. And of course, to give our first lecture for this semester. So please bear with me and strap your seat belts on because we're in for a ride. Yes, we're in for a great ride indeed. So this is Bio 165, the ecological and historical aspect of spatial distribution of plants and animals. This subject, to put it simply, is one of the most interesting subjects that I took in my master's here in UP Baguio. Sadly before, in my undergrad, I did not have the privilege to have this subject. Well, as it was not offered back then. So to think of it, you guys are really lucky to have this. So kudos to that. Actually, this is also the first time this subject is going to be taught in the undergrad. So yes, I'm hoping that we can learn more with this subject. So please, 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 please do give me a hard time with this subject because I am sure that both of us will learn a lot. By geography, where life lives, as you can see here in our PowerPoint. Because, well, it is. It is that, precisely. It is the study of how life have come to occupy the spaces in the world. And how they do that? It's pretty amazing, don't you think? That's by geography can sometimes have answers to the most perplexing questions regarding the distribution of plants and animals in the world. Like for example, how this plant in South America has a close relative in the tropical Pacific. Or take for example, this barren land, this island in Taal volcano after eruption can get repopulated by new vegetation and bird species given some time. Or take, for example, the birds of Darwin and Wallace in their voyages in the Galapagos and Malay Islands. How a single bird species can diversify into an array of species through great diversification. So as you can see here, we will be using a lot of these maps. I will let you get fond of this map later and later and later. We will use them, we will dissect them and analyze them to every bit because it will really help us. After all, it's in the name, biogeography. So for those people who are really bad or who really suck, <laughs> well, at pointing directions for tourists here in Baguio, Oh no, you're in great trouble. <laughs> anyway, this biogeographical models of migration of animals and the creation of these phylogenetic trees can sort, sort of give us a map to see the movement of organism across the planet. And that's the exciting part about biogeography. It can give us a bit of our natural history. So yeah, these are the Galapagos finches of Darwin. There are a lot of finches that arise from species of finches that arise from a single species that colonize the island. So their big size depends or big shape depends on what Primarily, they eat and they diversify, sort of like a spread out, because they experience an ecological release when they encountered 
a barren island. Moving on, regarding the diversity of species on Earth, we can see that there is indeed a big problem. We can see that, well, people or scientists tend to estimate the number of species on Earth for around some time now to about 5 to 50 million species. So that's, if you think about it, 5 to 50 million species. That's a really big, and it, we're talking about millions of species. Well, I think this boils down to the fact that, one, we scientists tend to have a bad day when we discuss or argue what a species is. Because really, a species, it's, it's really difficult, you know? It's really difficult to point out what is a species, what is not a species. The mere definition of species is a big problem. Secondly, taxonomic survey of the species of here, planet, is not really a focus for, well, the people. And the dwindling number of taxonopeeps, or people who study taxonomy, well, just made it really hard or difficult to have a rough estimate of the number, the real number of plants, animals, and microbes on Earth. Especially the microbes part. That one part will really screw up this figure because nobody really knows the exact number. All of them are just estimations by now. Our goal for this course is really to understand and document spatial and temporal pattern of the past and present biodiversity on Earth. That's our main goal. We need to see this non-random pattern. We will need to have an eye for this non-random pattern because we can see, we will see in the near future that there is this distinct repetitive pattern among biogeographical realms in the world. And since there is this pattern, this would imply that there is an underlying general process that dictates such pattern for occurring. So yes, biogeography is indeed a comparative observational science, which looks at the various factors that influence the spatial and temporal distribution of our plants and animals. That's our main goal. And as you can see here in our next slide, it says biogeography is a synthetic discipline of biology because it really is. It relies on the theories of different the theories and concepts of ecology, of population biology, systematics, eco evolutionary biology, and so on and so forth. And also earth sciences. If there's a new field, biogeography would likely take a nudge at that and use it. That's it. That's biogeography. It really focuses on the interaction of different concepts of biology, resulting to the characteristic spatial and temporal distribution of taxa, where we evaluate the historical and current distribution of this organism in the light of these, well, fields of biology, well-established well -established fields of biology. So, um, organismal-wise, if you think about it, there are three major fields of study in biogeography. We have phytogeography, zoogeography, and microbial biogeography. Fun side note, my, well, my special project when I was in my master's taking the subject, I really, I really liked microbial biogeography. 
I tend to, well, have my time no? analyzing these different latitudinal or range ranges of different microorganisms, both aquatic and terrestrial, because there are this certain distribution patterns for them. You can also include physical factors that would affect this microbial biogeography, like, for example, salinity in the beaches along the, the, the shorelines, and that's what I studied back then. It's a really interesting field of biogeography. Moving on to our next slide, approaches to biogeography. So the first one is historical biogeography. Well, the tip here is to base on the name itself. No? So since it is historical, it focuses on the origins. No? that those dispersal mechanisms that happened back then, we tend to reconstruct these events that happened, no? these origins, this dispersal, extinction of certain biotas. And that's, that's the exciting part. No? You tend to recreate the origin. That's the important thing about man. We, we tend to, we want to recreate what happened? We know, we we want to know where we came from, kumbaga. Moving on, ecological biogeography well accounts for the present distribution, the present distribution in terms of interaction between the basic interaction between organism and the physical environment. That's why we call it ecological biogeography. There's this physical. and the organism, and they interact with each other. That's ecological biogeography. And through that interaction, we can see changes or patterns of distribution of organism. Paleoecology, on the other hand, bridges the gap between two fields. It investigates the relationship between communities and the abiotic condition. So it checks on the abundance. It relates abundance, distribution, diversity to climate, soil, and what, well, physical parameters. So have you watched our videos? So this is the isotherm maps of Alexander Van Humboldt. I will also upload the video later on regarding our place in this map. Because this, this course, I will, well, I will try my best to put, to put it at home. No? I, will, I will put it at home. Although we have so much theories going and up, that applies to all the places on Earth, we will try to pin all of those and use it in our home, the Philippines. So these maps, we will get in touch with a lot of maps. If we have some time, I will teach you how to make maps using an open source platform where you can create maps. But if we have a time. Anyway, so these maps, these isothermic maps, tends to have a great impact on the biogeographical distribution of certain species. Of course, there are species that has a wide range of tolerable, tolerable, tolerable range. But for the case of these isotherms, it is really cool. And it's really interesting to see how this map can reflect the changes in species distribution of plants and animals. Next, analytical biogeography. It develops the general mathematical rules of how geography affects the evolution and distribution of plant animals. So this is the more technical part of biogeography, where we will have certain rules you know, or models that will predict 
how distribution of plants and animals occur in the world. And for the last part, conservation biogeography works hand in hand with biogeography to protect and restore the natural environment. The natural environment and the biodiversity therein. So that's conservation biogeography. And also that's my expertise. Well, kind of. And we'll talk about that in the later part of our course. So in analytical biogeography, maps and maps and maps, we'll use magnetic field maps, isotherm maps, any kinds of map that will reflect the distribution of species. It's, it, it is really interesting how these maps would predict somehow the distribution of species. So yes, when studying biogeography, people focus on the persistent themes that, that there is in the natural world. First one is when we classify geographic region, we base it on their biota. And this is actually very exciting for the case of the Philippines, especially since the Philippines is, well, relatively uh, ge geologically young region. And we will see our place in this grand scheme of geographic regions in the world. The second part of these persistent themes is how we reconstruct the historical development of certain organisms, including the origins, the spread, and the diversification of this organism. Yes, we usually tend to focus on this part two. We really trace them, so to speak. Next persistent theme is how we explain the differences in numbers as well as type of species in these geographical areas. Later on, we will see the great geographical areas, regions of the Earth, and we will try to get a, get, get a hands on these different types of species, these numbers of these different species. Because certain geographical areas well, are teeming with life than some. Next is usually we explain the geographic variation mm -hmm, of individuals or the population itself of closely related species. And we include trends in morphology, the sizes, of organism, how they changes as they occupy a new niche or a new island or habitat, and also the changes in behavior. For example, how some birds lose their ability to fly after migrating to a new island and then dying off since they can't escape the predators when the colonizers found that island. Things like that, no? We'll see things like that. But I wouldn't say biogeography did came to the realm, no? it went back to the realm, thanks to these four major breakthroughs or events that transpired. First part would be the expedition of Darwin and Wallace where, well, we all know the story. You have watched the videos, how they made the theory, how Darwin published his book, how he went on the Galapagos Island, how Wallace published, well, created the theory of natural selection, and how he went to the Malay Islands and sort of, sort of have a sick 
well, when, when he was sick, he, has, he had this dream. And the dream was that black people and white people, th no, that's Nelson Mandela. Anyway, disregard that. <laughs> the thing here is that this expedition of these naturalists, Darwin and Wallace, did gave, did push through the earlier, well, the proto part of biogeography into the front line back then. It was really exciting because it tends to give us or answer the question of where do we come from and how we relate to the rest of the natural world. This question, I guess, is a very important yet hard to answer question. Very important because, I guess, this comes from the fact that we, humans, yearn for an explanation, an explanation of our youth, our roots, and our beginnings. Well, especially for our, us Filipino, don't you think? Way, way back then, no? pre-colonial times, we see this we see this on our, on most of our indigenous people. Well, here in Cordillera, where communities tend to recite their ancestors, name, the, the names, the list, they kind of recite you know, orally the list of their ancestors as a sort of a rite of passage and also to show respect their ancestors. Because if it wasn't for them, they wouldn't be here. In the first place. That's, that's the thing, right? <clears throat> this expedition of Wallace and Darwin did became fruitful. They collected collected a lot of species and they pinned all the species. It, it really helps, no? Especially back then. There are really few scientists who had the money or the capacity to venture into this. So yeah, so as you can see here, natural natural selection will tend to give us this really grand story of how an organism is chosen by the environment. Well, their characteristic. And those that, well, does not fit, will get eradicated. <laughs> sorry, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Next part, I wouldn't say biogeography is biogeography without continental drift theory. Historical biogeography, paleobiogeography really depends on the theory of Alfred Wegener, on his continental drift theory. Back then, well, continental drift theory was a, <laughs> well, scientists laugh at Wegener when he proposed this theory, but it's really insightful. Well. For every child, no? Even a child can be insightful as he is. He can see that part of South America really fits with the part of Africa. No? It's like a jigsaw puzzle. And they only went apart or broken apart after some time due to this forces underneath, no? This convection forces that create oceanic ridges, seafloor spreading, that will create oceans eventually, and sometimes convergent boundaries will create mountains as high as the Himalayas, or trenches as deep as the Marianas Trench. That's continental drift theory, and we'll get back to that more on later. And yes, the third part of the emergence of biogeography as a science is really thanks to some technologies. 
the advancement of technologies, like for example, the advancement in geographic information system, GIS, where we create contour maps of the, the land. Yes, we can see different heights, no? elevation here of the places or yes, different areas. And I have I had an experience with this in my 230, in my CRE 230 class, where we map, we create this map, contour maps, all different kinds of maps of using a, an open software called QGIS. And what's really interesting about this is you can create maps of your own. You can you can put your name there, created by Patrick. I also created a campus map where I outlined every buildings in the in the campus. So I, I had a fan back then. But it's really important here because mapping is basic part of biogeography. We need all these maps to create certain patterns, no? Well, to make sense of certain patterns. Well, not political maps, but yeah, some physical parameter maps would really suffice the study of biogeography. And just as I said, if we have time, I will teach you how to do this map, if we have time, if and only if. Because this part of mapping is kind of hard. It took us, well, not hard, maybe difficult, medge, but it's doable. Next part of those technology is, well, genomics, metagenomics, all those nomics, omics, proteomics, scriptomics, transcriptomics, all those studies will really prove to be important. This is, well, in term of, terms of biogeography, the field of metagenomics or genomics, per se, it's really a young field no? to be incorporated in biogeography because before uh, naturalists rely on big things, the morphologies of organism, they tend to see these things. No? But for the case of genomics, we tend to focus or zoom in on the genetic blueprint of the organism. And we create these phylogenetic trees, these relationships, of these different organisms, relationships of genes. And the important thing here, when we venture or use, because we are users, when we use these kinds of technology or this field in our biogeography, it really predicts and it really helps a lot. It gives more details and defines the study. Well, it gives much deeper meaning to the study because we can see that everything is connected. Everything is connected. There's this tree of life and everything, everything came out of it. That's the beauty of it. And if you're in my class in Bio 110, I will teach you also how to use these certain softwares to create phylogenetic trees or analyze sequences. Because back then, people went for me, no? well, undergrad students went for me, and some of them, these are, this is some of, some parts of their, no, you know, the last one, this is the ideal version of the sequence. And this part is the not so ideal. No? This is the babagsak type of sequences. <laughs> but uh, I made sure that we make sense of this. And I'll, I'll teach you that if you're in my Bio 110 class, systematic class, sequences. No? <clears throat> 
And the last part would be the effect of humans on the distribution. This part of biogeography is really interesting because it's human-centric, first part, but if you think humans are inherently bad, you're wrong. Huh? That's not the case here. We're not pinning human as a bad man no? or woman. Sex is bad. Anyway, so so that's the thing, you know? It doesn't mean bad when we say anthropogenic. Any study that is anthropocentric is not inherently bad. No? Maybe it has some good in it. It's not morally bad in the first place. But we will see how this works out on us. No? Yes, anthropogenism or anthropocentrism is not ethically bad in the first place. If you think about, if you really think about it, anthropogenic, anthropocentrism is not bad. Because if we say that it is bad, we accept our fate. We slave, we slave away to these notions of economics that greed will take over or things like that. But the important thing in this anthropogenic effect, and we will see this later, we will try to incorporate the changes that man, that we, induce in our environment and how this fragments or changes the distribution patterns of organisms. Like for example, how we, <laughs> the, the thing right now in the internet is colocasias, right? This big gabi related plants with really broad leaves are being poached <laughs> in the outskirts of the Philippines and would be sold for what? 20 to 50 dollars? 50 dollars. 50,000 pesos? That's a big thing now, right? And that's the thing, no? We humans tend to introduce or remove species just because we like them. <laughs> like for example, how Marcos introduced escargot or golden apple snail in the Ilaos Norte, and how the DNR fucked up with janitor fish. Oh, no, no, not DNR. I mean Gloria. Anyway, so that, that's the thing, no? Humans really do affect this distribution of animals, and we will see that it's actually, you know, the growing, it's a growing factor is anthropogenic effects on the distribution of species around the world. And yes, that's it. If you have questions or comment, if you have, if you like it, leave a thumbs up. If you have questions or suggestions, leave it in the comment section below. And see you later. Peace out.